All right, everybody, I'm here for a one take hot take. I really want to do this kind of in the spirit of Jimmy Stegmeier based on the news that I'm about to share with you. So I'm just going to do this all in one take and we're going to talk about a lot of exciting things. So you might have heard that today, February 3rd, it was announced that Stonemeyer Games is releasing a new big box game called Red Rising. So it's designed by Jamie Stegmeier and a co-designer, uh, a friend of his, uh, another co-worker at uh, Stonemeyer Games, Alex, Alexander Schmidt. And so the two of them together have designed this game Red Rising. And like any Stonemeyer release or announcement, it's getting a lot of buzz and a lot of hype and people are really into what this game is going to be all about. And uh, I have to admit that I am too. You know, uh, over the years I've missed some Stonemeyer games. You know, like I haven't played Scythe. <gasps> Shoot me down. Uh, and I've, I've played Viticulture and Tapestry once a piece. You know, so, so I'm kind of, uh, I know about uh, Jamie Stegmeier and his designs and I really respect his designs. The thing that I know most about him is that all of his designs get very high praise. Uh, even uh, Tapestry, which had some mixed reviews, but it's still sitting at 232 on Board Game Geek as we speak. So it is a well-respected, highly sought-after game. And I really enjoyed that game as well. So when uh, Jamie Stegmeier, when Stonemeyer Games announces something, people get excited. And so I thought I would just give my own thoughts and opinions, insights into this game and what it could be about and what it could have in store for us. And what was really exciting to me is the story behind this game. So if you don't know, Jamie has been working on this game since 2017. Uh, kind of the tail end of 2017, he started uh, putting together some ideas. He loves these books, these Red Rising books, these novels, uh, science fiction dystopian novels, and he loves them. And he wanted to design a game around that IP. And so he contacted the author, publisher, all that stuff. He got the permission to start working on a game. And so uh, as he was working on the game, he just kind of came up against one roadblock after another. Uh, he said that he uh, brainstormed and prototyped and playtested four different designs for Red Rising before throwing in the towel. Uh, you might remember a couple years ago, so uh, in April of 2018, uh, he released on his website and on Twitter and these kinds of things publicly uh, the story of how he had been designing this game and it didn't work out for him. And he explained all the different iterations that he went through, which is really interesting to watch. I'm going to link uh, the video down below where he explains this design that failed because uh, it's really interesting to just hear him talk out and think out um, all of his design attempts and subsequent failures. This man, I love, I love J.B. Stegwire. I love his videos. He, he is so humble. He just sits in front of a camera and he just talks and just explains uh, things that are going on in his head. A lot of his videos are just his favorite game mechanism from particular games. Um, but every once in a while, he does more of a deep dive into uh, his development process, his creative process, his company. And he's just kind of a... And he has a blog that also does similar things. And he's just a wear a heart on a sleeve kind of guy. Um, he did videos like he, he got into a relationship. Um, he did a video detailing how that changed his life and changed the way that he worked and was really exciting and new for him. He's just a really humble, out there, what you see is what you get kind of guy. And I really respect that. And so for him to go out and share kind of this design failure uh, was something special. And so I am so happy to hear about this release now that I know that this was so long in the making for him and that he tried so hard because the video that he released documenting his um, trials was actually kind of a call out video. He was calling out other designers who would be interested in tackling the challenge of a Red Rising board game and who thought that they could overcome the challenges that uh, Jamie ran into or attack the mechanisms that Jamie was trying to attack in different angles and Jamie was saying hey if you can do this and if you can come up with a design that uh, I can get really excited about too and that embraces the world that you love this world of Red Rising you have to read the books first he said right but if you can come up with something 
I'll happily publish it. And I'll, I, I've actually stayed in contact with uh, the author of the books and the publisher, he said, uh, letting them know that there might be designers knocking on the door and if there's something worth pursuing that he'll happily pursue that as well. So for him, it was, it was just so important that the project got done and if he couldn't do it, he wanted someone to step up and do it. And so, so happy to see that Alexander Schmidt and Jamie Stegmeier got together. And so I was interested if it was going to be someone from the call out that was the co-designer on this game. Um, but it looks like uh, Alexander Schmidt knew Jamie since 2016. Um, they were, uh, Alexander was in his games group. Uh, they've been friends for a long time. Jamie has hired Alexander to be on his staff and uh, since 2020. Uh, and so uh, just kind of a good friends, good friends getting together to design a good game. So what I want to talk about a little bit is about kind of what some of the design challenges were for Jamie, because I think that gives us some insight into what we might be expecting from this game. There's also a great description that I'll read from the website about the, uh, the actual game that we'll be getting. And so basically one of the big challenges for Jamie for developing this Red Rising game is that in the story there's 14 casts. Kind of all of these, the civilization of humanity is broken up into 14 color casts. Uh, and each of the colors have different roles and abilities and these kinds of things. And so red is the lowest and then gold is the highest. And um, so when he's when he's looking at these 14 colors, when Jamie was looking at these 14 colors, he really wanted to incorporate all that into some kind of a game. And so he, he started off with his first version of the game. Let me look at my notes here. Um, his first version of the game was a deck building game. So, you know, typical deck building, you have a bunch of cards that are representing uh, all of these different faction and these houses and you're just trying to develop something. And he said it just didn't work. The deck building mechanic didn't work and he couldn't pinpoint what didn't work about it because if he could have, he would have fixed it and we would have been getting a game in 2018, 2019 as opposed to 2021. And so uh, version two, he moved to a bag building idea, which is really interesting. He loved Orle Orleans or Orleans and he wanted to try deck uh, bag building for that. And again, he just said, <laughs> Uh, the playtest was a disaster, he said. So it just didn't work. He just uh, fell totally on his face. So, and, and again, a big challenge for him was working with these 14 different colors. And um, in the books, uh, the 14 colors are distinct. But translating those uh, distinct uh, roles or abilities or things into a board game, you kind of end up with very similar things. Because he was saying that like, orange and green were like scientists, like green was scientists and orange were engineers. Um, in the story that works out fine to differentiate between the two, but in a board game that's kind of, it's very similar roles. Um, so he was really having a challenge of how to differentiate these things. And so then for version three, he came up with, um, again, you're sort of still meeple building. So, because there was this idea going through these designs of drafting meeples. So you would draft meeples into your pool and you would be able to do different things with them based on the color of them uh, to either build your empire or to um, kind of activate your empire that you were building. And so they were still working at that, but a cool idea that came out of this was that because of the cast, based on what level of cast, so, you know, gold being highest, red being lowest, so you would put uh, a gold meeple on a row and it would activate all of the other colors lower than gold in that row. And so I don't know how the colors kind of escalate, but you know, you would put a blue and then you would activate everything below blue in that row. So that's a really neat idea. I mean, I can get behind that design idea. And what he said about it was that it was cool and it was working, but it didn't capture the theme of the game for him. He just didn't feel like he was in that world anymore. And for him, it was going to be incredibly important that uh, nobody could say that the theme was pasted on or that um, even him. So he knew that the theme wasn't pasted on because he had worked really hard to match the mechanics with theme. But yet as he was playing it as a designer, 
he didn't feel like the theme came through. And that was something that was so important to him, was to make this theme come to life because it's such a story that's close to his heart. And so in the fourth design of this, there's this really cool um, way that he's trying to capture both the kind of grandness, the epicness of this story, as well as kind of the more personal dimension. Because he said that in the novel, you're really following one person. Um, and so how do you capture that personal dimension? And so there was this whole idea of four circular tracks, which would represent four different planets, and they would have bonuses around the tracks. So you'd move around the track and activate different bonuses. And um, then there would be an inner track that would be randomized for each game that would be kind of um, more specific, personalized abilities, these kinds of things. Um, and what's really funny to be hearing about that design idea was, is actually, listen to it, like watch, the vid watch his video. Uh, it's a really cool design idea. I could get behind a game that has this. But you could tell where kind of Tapestry came from a little bit. Because essentially Tapestry is for tracks around the side of the board. You're just kind of pushing cubes up a track. That's a common complaint of Tapestry. It's just kind of uh, a game that's all about just pushing cubes up tracks. But you know what? I really like that dimension in Tapestry. I thought that was really cool. The card play and the tracks in Tapestry really make a, a sweet game. So if you've heard bad things about Tapestry, play it. It's, it's a really good game. Um, and so this whole idea of tracks and activating uh, different bonus spaces um, again, mechanically was working really well for him, but the theme wasn't coming through. And so again, um, for him, theme was all important uh, to capture as well as innovative mechanisms, new things that we're doing in the game. And so when we're looking at what could be, I, I, I'm very excited because um, there's this whole notion of kind of like Deck building was worked out, bag building didn't work out so much, um, but deck building had some potential, and this uh, kind of drafting of meeples to activate certain abilities, or a meeple activating other meeples that are lower than them. Okay, so there was something to that, and then this whole idea of activating tracks, and along with the activating tracks design, there was actually this um, I split, you choose mechanic, where you would choose two cards from your hand, and then the player next to you would choose one to put in their tableau, and then you would put the other in your tableau. And so there was like a tableau building card thing. And so uh, really interesting to see if any of these mechanisms leak into the new game, or if we're going to get a whole new thing. So a couple of my thoughts around this are that this game is incredibly timed uh, with Dune Imperium being such a a hot game. Uh, with Dune Imperium making such a big splash, this game comes at no better time. Because I know for myself, I love Dune Imperium, and it, it's this excellent adaptation of a science fiction novel into a board game where the theme and the mechanics really mix well. Um, but yet anybody can play the game. You don't have to know the story to play the game. And so I'm hungry for another game with this, with a kind of science fiction theme, with an epic scope, with really solid game mechanisms. And so when this was announced, I was like, here's my, here's my itch to another Dune Imperium. I don't know if you have this. I have this all the time where I play a game. I really love it. Instead of playing that game over and over again, I try and look for other games that are like it, that do similar things, but a little differently. And so Red Rising comes in to my rescue saying, hey, keep on playing Dune until uh, later on when this is released. But when it's released, you get another uh, sweet little science fiction epic type mechanism game. So really excited about uh, how this is going to combo, I think, and really benefit from the timing of this. The other thing is I'm just going to read what's on the website describing the game. Enter the futuristic universe of Red Rising based on the book series by Pierce Brown, featuring a dystopian society divided into 14 casts. You represent a house attempting to rise to power as you piece together an assortment of followers, your hand of cards. Will you break the chains of the society or embrace the dominance of the golds? Okay, so that's a gold cast. Red Rising is a hand management combo building game for 1-6 to six players, 45-60 to 60 minute playtime, you start with a hand of five cards, and on your turn you will deploy one of those cards to a location on the board, activating that location's benefit. You will then gain the top card from another location face up, or the deck face down, adding it to your hand as you enhanced your endgame point total. 
Awesome. So I think it really bodes well that he's going to be keeping in these 14 casts. He's managed a way with Alexander to make all the colors work. So to keep that theming of the game, keep that close to the story. So that's really exciting for me. And what's also exciting to see is how deck building turned into hand management and how tableau building turned into um, this kind of idea where you're going to put a card out on the board and it's going to activate a space. And that, like, this is the cool, like, this is the coolest mechanic, just reading about it. I'm like, because I'm a big Century Spice Road fan, and so that's not a deck building game. It's kind of a hand building game where you just add cards to your hand. Um, when you get them, they go right into your hand. There's no discard pile or anything. And then you play cards from your hand, and then when you've kind of executed um, um, whatever cards you want to play, uh, or if the other cards in your hand are going to do anything, you just pull back the cards you played back into your hand. And so this kind of has a ring of that, where you have five cards in your hand, you're going to play one to a location, activate its benefit, then you're going to bring the, another card back into your hand, either a face-up card that you know what you're getting, or a face-down card from a deck. And so your hand is kind of constantly, kind of a rotating door um, hand that you're working with as you go through this game. So, you know what, based on all the thought and all the work that's already gone into this game, and... What I'm seeing in the brief description, I think this is going to be a solid game. The 45 minute to 60 minute playtime is also sweet. That's awesome when you can just pop a game down uh, that has really crunchy, meaty tactics and strategy. And then it's done and you are feeling totally satisfied and you had a blast. Because um, Tapestry, uh, while a great game, did, you know, it was a little long sometimes. But um, this is going to be punchy. So really excited about River Rising. And, and you know what I'm most excited about? I'm most excited about that a man who poured his heart into going after something that he really believed in was humble enough to admit that he couldn't do it and put a call out to other people to take up the torch and do it. And then at the end of the day, he still circles back around, finds a partner in crime, and accomplishes... Um, what he thought at one point was unaccomplishable. So, Jamie Stegmaier, uh, just my heart goes out for you. I'm cheering for you. I think this is going to be excellent, and I hope that um, this just goes gangbusters for you, and that all of uh, the blood, sweat, and tears that you put into this uh, pays off a bunch, and that you accomplish your goal of getting people into the Red Rising series, and that... Uh, your game just brings joy to people for years to come. So, Jamie, you are the man. Keep trucking. Thank you so much for this gift on this February 3rd. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening to this, this one take hot take. And uh, just subscribe or whatever if you want. And we'll talk to you later. Come back for other videos. I do all sorts of other stuff too. Okay, peace out, everyone.